What's going on, everybody? My name's Nick Betts. I am a sports enthusiast and a tech novice coming at you today with AWS On Air Sports. Today, we're going to be talking with NASCAR about how they're using AWS in the cloud to move their sport forward in some really cool and exciting ways. We're going to be talking about how they've integrated the tech into their cars to provide some more real-time stats to their drivers. We're going to be talking about how they have their video archive. They have over 70 years of races saved through the cloud and also how they do things like power their app. We're going to be joined by some people from NASCAR directly, then also some tech people for the second half of the show to explain exactly how it all goes down. If you're new to the program, welcome. We air every two weeks on Wednesdays, talking to a new professional sports league about these same types of topics, how they're doing things like next-gen stats or uh, advanced stats or advanced metrics or whatever their league calls it, how it's impacting their sport and being used by players and coaches, and kind of looking to the future, what they're looking to do with AWS in the cloud as it goes on from there. So we're excited to have you. Again, my name's Nick. We've got Taylor, our producer, on the backside here. We've got Debbie, my manager, right in the comments section. I encourage all of you to drop comments in. We're going to answer as many of them as we can as the show goes. I'm also going to quick shout out that uh, my LinkedIn feed is a little bit slow uh, from this stream right now. So I'm going to have it up on a second screen over here. So if you see me glancing over there, just to make sure I see y'all's LinkedIn comments. I promise I'm not reading emails on the side. Uh, but we're excited to have you here today. First up, we're going to have Chris Wolford join us from NASCAR. So let's go ahead and give him an introduction. What's going on, Chris? How are you doing? Hey, Nick. Good. How are you doing? Nice to be here. Good. Yeah, I'm excited to have you here. Everybody, this is Chris from NASCAR Directly. He is their managing director for media and event technology. Chris, that's a bit of a mouthful, but what exactly does that title actually mean? So in a lot of ways, that means I'm one of the resident geeks here at NASCAR, where I get to build and design and develop all these unique toys centered around racing and motorsports for NASCAR, as well as uh, media fronts and where they collide together is, is my domain here at NASCAR. Awesome. Perfect. Yeah, no, I'm, we've been talking to everybody for the last two weeks and prepping for this show. And Chris basically has his finger on the pulse of everything that NASCAR does. We were saying before the show started like 10 minutes ago, a lot of people don't think of NASCAR as a technology company. Uh, and it kind of dawned on me the last two weeks. That's sort of exactly what you guys are. You race cars, right? It's all about coming up with the next mechanical advantage and engineering the best car and engineering the best innovation. Uh, so it's kind of you guys basically are a tech company just in the sports world. Yeah, for sure. In a lot of ways, NASCAR was founded around the technology component, right? The car is a engineering marvel itself. And then you throw on all the modern technology on top of it, which is where I come in. And you get all these nerdy, fun things that you get to do with the car in exciting ways. Yeah, there's so much to talk. I'm excited to get to everything. Before we get going, though, I always like to ask our guests from these leagues, right? What got you involved in NASCAR? What drew you to this sport and this particular job? Sure. So for me, it started around the media side of the business. So I had worked for almost 18 years now on the media side and NASCAR represented this true way of getting into sports, which I love. I have always loved since being a little kid and uh, allow me to do the fun media things uh, and play with race cars at the same time. So, you know, how can you say no to that? Exactly. I think that's just an innate human uh, thing, right? Everybody likes fast cars. Everybody likes seeing how quickly they can go and everything. I'm, you know, NASCAR is a very like base human, <laughs> human yeah. instinct, right? True. Perfect. So also everybody in the comments, you know, Chris loves to see, and we love to see who's your favorite driver. Uh, if you have any questions from him as we're going here, be sure to drop them in the chat. We'll try to answer as many as we can from LinkedIn, Twitch, Twitter, wherever you're watching from. And uh, yeah, let us know your favorite driver. So Chris, let's get down to business here. I've been excited for this for two weeks. I can't hold it back anymore. Can you start with just basic background? We've just discussed like NASCAR basically is a technology company just in kind of a more athletic way, right? Yeah. What is the background 
to this technological approach with NASCAR because you guys have really embraced tech a lot more than a lot of other pro sports leagues or even just sports in general have, right? It's kind of the nature of the beast. So what's the background of that approach? What made you guys kind of invest in this even before uh, the relationship with AWS? Sure. So in a lot of ways, NASCAR is a data oriented company, right? So we have all this information about uh, folks attending the race, the race event itself, and all the metrics and information around the race vehicles themselves. So mm -hmm. combine that all together and you have this, this task to tackle. Um, and that's what's exciting for us as we have a data vision of how we aggregate your traditional data sense of moving bits and bytes, but also all the video components that we have. So really combining those into new ways, new exciting ways for our fans and our partners and our competitors uh, to gain insight is really how this kind of sticks together and pushes the boundaries of what we do for NASCAR and the industry. Yeah, yeah. And real quick, we just had a bunch of new people join the show. So quick introduction again. Everybody, my name's Nick from AWS On Air Sports. This is a show where we dive in every other Wednesday where we talk to a different professional sports league about how the cloud and AWS is impacting their sport. Today, I'm joined with Chris Wolford from NASCAR. He's basically the tech guru over there. And what we've been saying is NASCAR is kind of a tech company in the sports world, right? We're always looking for new innovations in cars, new innovations in getting decisions made faster on the track where they're already going 200 plus miles an hour. So today, uh, Chris and I are going to be talking about how NASCAR has kind of been leading some innovation in the technology specter, spectrum, I'm sorry, of their, of their sports world. If you have any questions for Chris or myself as we go here, be sure to drop them in the chats. Uh, we'll try to answer as many of them as we can. Then just let us know your favorite race car driver. Who's, uh, who's going to win the playoffs this year, right? Because I know you guys are in the middle of that, right, Chris? Yeah, we are. So we just passed our first cutoff race and into the next round going into Texas this week. So oh, it should be exciting. Yeah, it's an exciting time of year for you guys. Yeah. So we, we just talked about kind of the background of the tech approach in general at NASCAR, right? So time back back to AWS and the cloud. How did that come about? Sure. So we've always, uh, as long as the NASCAR website has been around, has been attached to AWS in some way or fashion. So pushing that forward a few years, what we were really looking at is how do we take our video archive? So we have the entire history about anything motorsports in the US in a lot of ways centered around NASCAR since we founded in 1948 to present day, which is a large sum of video at, at the end of the day. That was all on prem. So how do we get that off of being on just LTO tapes that are really old technology? Um, yeah, what are LTO tapes? Is that like what the dinosaurs used? What it, yeah, it feels like it these some days. younger people watching here. I don't think they even know what DVDs are. <laughs> yeah, way past then. So what we've done is we were really looking for somebody that could help us move all this data, which equated to being at, at that time uh, 15 petabytes of information huge amount of video, uh, well over 500,000 hours of content, and really putting that someplace that we could access anytime without any downtime, without any issues to get it in and out of our facility for the creative process and for our, our partners, our broadcast partners. So really that was the key kickoff that really exploded our activity on AWS and really pushed us to use more of yeah. S3 and DynamoDB and all of these different services that you guys offer to allow us to build some really cool stuff. Um, and it all started with the video archive for us. Gotcha. So basically, you all have over seven. You basically have every race dating back to the 40s, it sounds like, right? Yeah. You just had those laying around in tapes in somebody's garage. And you're <laughs> like, we should probably upload these to the cloud, make it a little bit easier to manage. Yeah. Thankfully, it wasn't everybody's oh, garage. <laughs> we got some good video vaults back in the day. But yeah, so it was a good solid 18 month process to get everything wow. uploaded and moved. But uh, yeah, we got there. So that was the kicker. That's awesome. So does it make it easier for y'all to use those clips and stuff now? Like what, what all do you use that archive for now that it's uploaded to the cloud? Yeah. So now that everything's up there, we have more direct access to it, right? You don't have to wait for it to be restored and moved and put on storage and wait for the file restore. All that nonsense is just gone. You make the request, it transfers the file back to our headquarters here in Charlotte and 
our creative team cannot start using it for their creative process. So uh, that's creating shows for our broadcast partners or the post-production shows that we do for NASCAR and NASCAR studios. Um, really all those creative kind of components that you want to tell a story uh, about any sort of race or activity around motorsports. Gotcha. 18 months to get all that. That's a long time. <laughs> I can't even, I mean, that's kind of hard to wrap my brain around, but I guess you guys had 70 years of content. So a year and a half to get it all uploaded. Is yep. it isn't too crazy? Oh, so yeah. this all started from uploading this historical archive and kind of blossomed from there. And I know we're involved in a lot of different aspects of the sport now. And that's kind of what I wanted to ask you next. When you look at NASCAR, maybe 15 years ago and compare it to today, Besides this video archive and making those old races more accessible for the fans and broadcasters and everybody else, what has changed in NASCAR with all of this explosion of cloud computing technology in the last decade? Sure, certainly in the past 15 years, even five years, if you look at it, uh, the way we officiate the races is even different than what it used to be. We used okay. to hand measure things with oh, templates of, of, the, of the cars to really go through the inspection process. Now we have optical scanning stations that measure each um, car as they go through the inspection. We have underbody scanning. Uh, this is another form of, of optical tracking. Optical tracking itself is the cars go around the racetrack itself so we know their position. All of these different things, replay, I could go on and on. We got a lot of nerdy uh, toys to play with here at NASCAR. Um, yeah. But all of those combined projects over the past 10, 15 years have really created this awesome innovation environment that we hear, have here at NASCAR that allow us to do these things. So I would say that it's the heavily centered around our racing product and the things that we do uh, to host a race uh, yeah. and the push for that. What would you say is kind of the biggest change? So we, we mentioned a lot of things there. We got the archive, we got the stats, we've got the changes to the cars and inspection. Has there been anything once we got past that video archive, like what was the next aha type of moment? The, the next aha, for me at least, comes with the next-gen car. Mm -hmm. So it was a new version of the Cup Series vehicle that re we released the year before last. And with it, it brought a lot of technical uh, evolution uh, to get okay. the car more towards what a consumer at home, what you could buy, what I could buy um, from uh, the American manufacturers and, and Toyota that we work with, right? So having that car allowed us to look at the technologies that are in that car and how do we pull that information out of the car in real time not like delayed yeah. once you get to to the pit road or after the race we want it now and gotcha. we want every bit of information off of that car or about that car now um, gotcha. so really that was that was the coolest thing and building out that ecosystem and that platform um, that's the exciting bit for me Okay, so what? Uh, how did those next gen cars like? Before we get into the technical specs, right? Just yeah. thinking about more from like a strategic or a uh, experiential perspective. How did that shift how fans experience your sport, or how did that shift how teams look at their sport? Because I assume if we're suddenly able to get through inspections faster, that changes things for teams. Or if we're able to get more data quicker, that changes teams, and then that uh, also would affect how the fans see the sport, right? Sure. So in a lot of ways, it gets the competitors closer to do their analysis live of how they want to run the race, how they want to uh, make their inferments about what's going on with the race. Um, and I'm talking a lot about data coming off the car, but the next gen car also has multiple video pass. And it is also the first time uh, with this car that we put a camera in every last race car that is in the event. Yeah. So you take all of that and you bring that closer to the fans and the stands remotely and really be able to see, feel and get that experience of what is it like to be in the car yeah. uh, and see the different avenues of, of what's going on. So those pull you closer in. And, and I'm a big fan of being closer in to the, uh, the race action. Yeah, and that's something, you know, again, in prepping for this show that is really stood out to me as unique about NASCAR's approach is you guys actually are able to put fans kind of with the drivers, with the athletes. What does this look like in the car? That's really the only sport that does that. It's not like we have uh, football players running around with cameras in their helmets so you can see why that quarterback made that pass or 
you know, hockey players with a camera on the puck. I'm sure that would be a nightmare. So, like, it's very unique. You guys are able to give your fans a much more up close and personal uh, experience when they're watching these races. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. for sure. The, the closeness that you get in NASCAR and viewing NASCAR is, is awesome. Yeah. Obviously I'm a little biased, but I would say it is. Really <laughs> I, I'm you're biased. I don't know where I would get that impression from. Do you work for them? <laughs> All right. So get, let's get into some of the tech specs of these cars, uh, of these cars themselves. So there's so much informational, or I'm sorry, there's so much information available nowadays, like we just alluded to from these cars. We've got the cameras in them. We've got the sensors on them. Teams are able to get more data than ever before about what's going on real time, what's happening in the car, on the track. How did all of these stats come to be? Was it just something where all were like, let's just put a bunch of computers in these cars and see what happens? Or like, what was the plan in terms of executing these next-gen cars? Sure. It's really about insights. So what are the interesting things, what are the valuable things um, that can come off of the car for the competitors, for the engine builders, for the fans, for the broadcasters? So you look at that and then you look at what are the different components in the car and how they can be useful to gather further insights. So it's with that in mind that really mm -hmm. defines what we pull off the car and how we pull off the car um, yes. and what components go into the car. That's another yeah. fun thing. I think gets lost in translation. You know, it's it's stock car racing. So all the cars, when we weigh them, have to be within a certain threshold. So that yeah. means anything we put in the car to get data or video out of the car have to be equal across the board. Gotcha. So when we were building um, the next gen car and looking at the data and video aspects, you have to keep in mind that to the you know to the gram level and whatnot that you're not doing something that would inhibit one car from being a better than another car um, yeah so that's a fascinating part uh, to me at least yeah it's a cool strategic part I'm, just, I'm not not everybody would i mean at least i didn't connect those dots right away of like actually we have to consider the weight of the car and kind of how that's going to impact different drivers yeah. uh, real quick before we move on we had a question come in from linkedin here uh talking about do we collect or do you guys collect uh, driver information too throughout the race? Is that part of this next gen car or is it mostly focused on the car itself right now? So it, right now it's mostly focused on the vehicle itself. So we have a lot of telemetric data. So things about the engine itself specifically uh, and the location of the car. Those are really the focal points that we have right now. Gotcha. So yeah, we got, we got a lot more comments coming in. People are excited. Cars and AWS, you know best uh best two things right so if you guys have any questions uh like victoria just had please drop them in the chat we'll try to answer them as we go here uh, but chris let's get back to those stats right so did i assume y'all worked with the you know the drivers the teams the league as a whole and figuring out what stats to provide to these uh from these next gen cars what type of data is collected and how does that happen Sure. So the again, the type of information collected is really engine related information. Okay. So and location data, which gives you things like throttle position or gear. You know, are you in first? Are you in second? Are you in reverse? Um, all those sorts. <laughs> That's of things. an important one to know. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, Got a little Lightning McQueen across the finish line. Right? <laughs> yeah, not so much. Um, that would be an interesting race move. So. <laughs> Uh, with that, so we have all those metrics that we get off the car. Now, how we facilitate that is a combination of different things. And that's where we have Amazon coming into play. So from the vehicles, it's a wireless transmission back to our TV compound. In that TV compound at the track, we have a series of semis that act as roaming data centers. And in those semis, we have some servers. Those servers collect the data off of the car uh, after it hits the RF transmission. And then we get it, we decode it, and then it's accessible to everybody at the track there. And then that data is synchronized up to AWS and can be accessed anywhere in the world by folks in our industry that have access to it and have authorization to it. So it's a combination of using EKS services in the cloud and, and really um, hybrid cloud architecture with what we have clusterized at the track. Gotcha. Okay. 
And it looks like we're getting some questions too about maybe stats we can't quite collect yet. So guys, uh, you know, we're seeing those comments. We'll save that particular one until the end. We're going to get to some future looking stuff here in a bit. Uh, but bringing it back to what we're doing right now, right? And how these cars are collecting data now. You presented this uh, napkin idea is what you called it into how you wanted all of this to work and kind of how you envisioned uh, pulling all this data and getting it to teams and everything. Can you kind of tell our audience what that was? I thought that was a really cool backstory. Yeah, so we decided we wanted to do this. And you decide a great idea or a very cool idea. Well, how do you do it? So then we started just kind of tinkering in at dinner or lunch one, one day. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, you go through the different iterations of ideas. And next thing you know, your little scribble pad is, is full of different things. Um, but those scribble pad notes became the foundations of what the solutions architecture was for um, this system, which we call the event racing data platform, mm -hmm. uh, really formed and was then later validated um, by the customer engineering team that I work with, with at AWS to build this out. So okay. it, it all came from that small, quick idea and exploded in time to this, this platform that everybody uses today. I love that story. It honestly is like a stereotype inventor movie trope. Like you just <laughs> drew it out on a napkin and suddenly it became this amazing, innovative idea. So I love that background. And you said a lot of this data, we do all this stuff within 10 milliseconds. Is that oh, right? Yeah. I buried the lead on that one. So yeah, every 10 milliseconds, we pull data off of the car from the computer in the car, otherwise known as the ECU. So every 10 milliseconds off of each and every car in the race event, we pull data off and transmit it. So at the end of the day, at the end of the race for a typical uh, 38, 36 car event over a three hour period, we roughly, just on telemetric data, have over 2 million data points that have come off of the collective cars. Yeah. So we throw all that together with the optical tracking data and the inspection data that we have. For a race event, we are over a billion data points that have occurred in a race wow. weekend. So it's, it's a lot. Um, yeah. It's a lot. It's exciting. And, and there's a lot of interesting math and data flow that goes into that. Yeah, you need all those semis to process <laughs> that information. Yep. All right, so we've kind of got a basic idea of what data we're collecting, a basic overview of how it's collected. Uh, can you talk to some about how is it used then by drivers first and then maybe by how does it impact the fans themselves? So we've taken sure. it in the semis. What happens from there? How do the teams use it? Yeah, so from there, the teams grab it and they use it in different tools, different analytic tools that they have trackside, whether that's along pet road or back in their uh, haulers. Their, so their own semis at the track in the garage or okay. it's shipped back to their North Carolina offices where they have their war rooms. Uh, additionally, you have broadcasters that also take those metrics and that's what you see on television. Okay. All the, the, you know, the throttle and brake measurements that you see during a race, for example, are feed and source from these technological components. And then from a fan perspective, uh, when you're at a racetrack, the information that's coming off of there, the positional information, uh, the, those metrics that we're talking about, uh, all are sourced from the same platform. Gotcha. So all these new metrics, is, is that kind of from your experience, you know, working with teams and stuff, has that changed any of the strategy for these teams since this has become a thing? Because they have all this information now uh, that maybe they didn't have access to before. Do you think that's kind of changed how teams go about their race day strategies? I think the teams do a very good job of analyzing their data and mm -hmm. getting their further insights from it. I'm sure it's had positive effects in how quickly they're able to consume that data where it was slightly more delayed in historical points. But yeah, yeah I'm sure they have a blast with it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure there's some trash talking too about uh peak, peak data times and you know, the best performing cars and all that stuff. More, more stats to point to as to why you're better than your opponent. Right. <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot <laughs> to lean from those, those data points. So yeah, yeah. for sure. All right. So, uh, real quick, everybody, again, uh, I'm Nick from AWS On Air Sports. I'm talking with Chris Wolford here from NASCAR about how the cloud is impacting their sport, changing things about their car designs, how they gather stats, 
how they record and are able to process videos for their archive. They have over 70 years uh, archived of different races dating back to the 40s. Uh, right now, we're talking about how people kind of use the stats that they're able to glean from these next gen cars. Uh, so with that, Chris, let's talk about the fan experience. I know you guys are really proud of the NASCAR app that you came out with. Uh, it's very revolutionary in terms of what kind of access it's able to give to fans. Can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. So now that we have access to all these videos coming from the cars, as well as the data, one of the things that we really pushed and we pushed Amazon to help us with was at the Chicago street course race that we had this year. First time running a street course event. Um, and really allowing the fans in the stands at the venue to see the different fields of view as the cars were going around the track. Well, how do you accomplish that? Well, everybody has a cell phone these days. So what better way to allow everybody to see things than take the video at the track and port it into an app? So we did just that with our, yeah. our friends at Amazon. So uh, in Chicago, we had 20 feeds going into the, everybody's phone that you could watch. Um, mm -hmm which is great, plus the, the localized feed there. So uh, it was a very compelling way to see the race while you were at the track. Yeah, I really like you were talking about how you try to take a 360 degree view of fans, right? A lot of the sport and a lot of the decisions that y'all make are very fan driven. And the, this app is definitely a product of that. Is there a certain aspect of it that you like to brag on the most or excites you most as a fan to be able to see on race day? Uh, for me as a fan, the thing that I like the most is I can follow the different camera views. Yeah. If you're in the front stretch or in the grandstands, especially at a road course like Chicago, um, it's very hard to see the back stretch through the trees or, or through the cityscape in Chicago. Uh, so really being able to see those multiple angles to yeah. see the action um, from your phone was, was pretty cool. Yeah, we got some... What's the, uh, can you remind everybody, what is the name of the app? We got some people requesting uh, some download sure. information. So it's the NASCAR Tracks app. All right, there you go, folks. Download that NASCAR Tracks app. It'll give you some new insights that you probably haven't ever had before in terms of uh, accessibility to the race. So, Dave, I know our time here is wrapping up a little bit. Real quick to everybody, I want to make sure everybody has a chance um to ask chris any questions about nascar about the stuff we've talked about today before he leaves in a couple of minutes uh so drop them in the chat we'll try to answer as many as possible uh chris the last thing i kind of want to talk about for a few minutes is you know we've established nascar is a very tech driven company right so what like we've talked about a lot of the innovations in the past is there anything that you're looking forward to the most in the future, uh, looking forward into like new innovations or next steps you want to take uh, in this tech journey for NASCAR? Yeah, it's, it's definitely hard to pinpoint it down to one or two things because we have so many different things at NASCAR. Um, but if I was going to pigeonhole it to something, it would be now that we have the video archive in the cloud and then we have all the data about the race events, marrying the two and applying okay. machine learning models around what's going on in the race and applying it to the data. And then building on that with some generative AI sort of connections so that people um, outside fans uh, can go ahead and make queries, um, find out interesting things and create their own compelling uh, nuggets of information. So marrying all different facets of technology into one yeah. Uh, is is pretty cool. Yeah, it would definitely be cool. And we got kind of a related question I've been excited to circle back to as well. Uh, somebody wanted to know, is there a particular stat right now that you wish you could capture, uh, but right now, like, we don't have the tech to do it? Is there anything yeah. that jumps to mind? Uh, awesome question, first off. Uh, <laughs> nothing that jumps to mind right now. Um, but I'm sure the, the race engineers up at the R&D shop can think of a, a litany of things that the, the computer yeah. isn't thinking gonna, of correctly. You're going to be getting a whole bunch of uh, emails like, man, you should have mentioned this. <laughs> this is what we're talking about now. Yeah. So is there anything else before we say bye, Chris, uh, that you want to let our fans know as they're watching here uh, on Twitch and LinkedIn and Twitter about NASCAR? Any closing thoughts that you want them to think of uh, when they leave today? Closing thoughts would be uh, when you're watching the race at home and you're seeing things come across the screen, imagine as, as you sit there from your house 
what it's like to be in the car and seeing all the data come through. You can pull up those in-car cameras. You can pull up the data, and you'll have a real feeling. And then, if you're a fan of gaming, you can go into iRacing Rig, some virtual reality environments, and kind of replay those environments at a certain point in time. So those are, are the things. Um, for me, as a fan of the sport, looking at that, that I get excited about. So I hope everybody does as well. I think they do. We're getting lots of comments about that kind of stuff. So, you know, definitely fun to have you on today, Chris. Uh, again, everybody, this is Chris Wolford. He's the managing director for Meeting Event Tech at NASCAR. Basically, that just means he is the tech guru behind all the cool innovations you see at NASCAR with these next gen cars, with their app, with their video archive. If you guys are late joining the show here and want to see uh, other things Chris has talked about, Yep, we can drop a link right here in terms of where you can see stuff. Uh, we upload uh, VOD ver or video on demand versions of this show to YouTube uh, every week. Uh, usually give us a couple of days to be able to get it up there. Uh, but you can also rewatch it uh, right here on Twitch or LinkedIn or what have you. So, Chris, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure to talk to you and uh, hope you have a great rest of your day here. Appreciate it, Nick. Nick, it's been a pleasure. Thanks, man. Thank you. All right, everybody, we're going to transition now to talk about more of the how behind a lot of this stuff that Chris just talked about uh, is changing at NASCAR. So the how behind that we were able to migrate that historical data archive, how does it work? And then also how we power these next gen cars and the stats that come with them. And to help me with that, uh, we've got Carlos Valdez from AWS. He's the technical account manager uh, for NASCAR. He's kind of the guy that helps make all of these things happen. So let's go ahead and introduce him. What's going on, Carlos? How are you doing today? What's up, Nick? Wow, that's, uh, I don't know how you can't get excited after hearing that from Chris. Yeah, there's so much cool stuff that's very unique to NASCAR. Like their sport really allows for more hands-on direct access to their fans than a lot of others. So I always love talking to Chris about what they're doing over there. Yeah, and that's that's one of the fun parts of my job is to be able to to work with customers like that and just, you know, be at, at the at the edge of technology and help have them push us as a company to to meet their requirements and meet their technology. Absolutely. And real quick, Carlos, before we jump into the how behind all that stuff Chris talked about, I want to do a quick plug for our survey. Make sure we get the voice of the viewer here today. So we're going to quick drop a link in the chat, guys, to a survey. Uh, just take 60 seconds. Let us know how you like the show. What kind of use cases do you want to see on future episodes? What kind of leagues do you want us to cover uh, in future iterations of the show? Again, we air every other Tuesday. And the point of the show is to give you guys kind of an inside look into how technology is changing the world of sports, and then also give you a glimpse into how exactly those changes happen. You know, the how behind all these next gen stats you hear so much about. I definitely, you know, if I knew all of this stuff existed when I was in college, probably would have majored in this. Uh, kind of keep me closer to the sports world, but I'm happy I'm able to do this show with y'all. So take a minute, do that. It says five minutes, probably closer to one minute. First 50 respondents will get $10 in AWS credits to try out some of the services that you're about to hear about from Carlos. So, Carlos, I said you're a technical account manager for AWS for NASCAR. What the heck does that mean? Uh, basically, I'm a member of the AWS account team for NASCAR, and I work as their technical advisor and help to orchestrate uh, our AWS services and people to help them succeed in the ways that he's ta that Chris talked about and be able to innovate in the cloud and, and help them reach their, their objectives with us in partnership. Perfect. So you're kind of, you got to see it all. You and Chris are besties. Uh, you get to work <laughs> on all these things together. That's super cool. Yeah. It's really cool because I kind of get the, uh, I, I, I myself am kind of a geek as well. And just to be able to see behind the curtains, with all the technology that he talked about, it is really fun and exciting for me. Perfect. So I'll ask Chris, I'd like to ask you too, what, like, as, what kind of a fan are you of NASCAR? Do you just love NASCAR? Like, how did you get involved with this particular role? Because it's a very specialized set of skills, very Liam Neeson type set of skills to be able to... <laughs> 
execute all of these things for NASCAR. What's your connection to NASCAR personally? Uh, the connection is I've been a, a motorsports fan and in particular NASCAR for a very long time now, pretty much since being a kid. And uh, I just enjoy motorsports in general and the the things that NASCAR does, you know, with, with their cars lately with the next gen car and the competition and just that aspect of it to me is personally exciting. Mm-hmm. And I love to see what they do with the technology that like he mentioned with the app and just with the cars and the drivers are able to do on the, on the track. Gotcha. And I think I'll ask the question that all of us are wondering here. Uh, do you guys get to test these cars yourself? Like, <laughs> you know, you get to do a couple of laps at the motor speedway, go 300 miles an hour and be like, yep, it works. I should probably test it again though. Uh, I wouldn't mind doing so, but yeah, I'm <laughs> not really I'm trying to trying to plug you. I don't know if they would here. trust me. <laughs> <laughs> Chris is going backstage, like, oh, maybe not. <laughs> yeah, but I wouldn't mind doing it. Like, for instance, with the driving experience at the Daytona track. But yeah, no, <laughs> okay. I get to see it from behind the scenes. All right, you know, maybe that's a little safer for uh, drivers <laughs> like you and me. <laughs> But, you know, let, let's get into some of this tech sure. stuff. And everybody, just as a reminder, if you've got any questions for Carlos as we're talking here today about how we're executing all of these different parts of the innovations of NASCAR. So we're going to be looking at the video archive. They've got over 70 years of historical races accessible. Uh, we're going to be talking about the next gen cars, all this other fun stuff. Uh, if you've got any questions as we're going, please drop them in the chat, whether you be on Twitch or LinkedIn or wherever you're watching from. We'll try to answer as many of them as we can. So, Carlos, let's dive into it. We heard from Chris kind of how the partnership between AWS and NASCAR started from NASCAR's perspective. What did that look like from AWS's perspective? I think it followed a, a similar trajectory. And um, like he mentioned, they ha- they were on AWS before the, the official partnership started back in 2019 mm-hmm. with their websites. But I think, it, like he mentioned, it, it pretty much kicked off in a major way in 2019 when we were selected as their uh, preferred cloud computing provider. And um, as you mentioned, the, the first and focus of that partnership was to get their media archive, which he mentioned at the time was 70 years worth of mm-hmm. video, audio, and images of all their races, of their so- historical races, and being able to migrate that into AWS. And then the, the, the next, you know, group of, of projects that we that were focused on was like you mentioned the the data coming off the tracks and being able to help them create that platform that he mentioned that we'll talk about now and then also the the advancements that we've been able to leverage with aws services for the app which is you know is one of the main focuses of, of nascar is the increasing the fan enhance enhance the fan experience. Yeah, and I think what the the app specifically the tracks app is one of their major focuses, and um, we could talk about how the AWS services that help to to facilitate that. Yeah, so you know something that I found interesting about this relationship, I feel like a lot of the relationships AWS has has with these professional sports leagues kind of just explode on the scene, right? And NASCAR's was a lot more linear almost we started with them kind of using some of our services then we partnered and did this video archive and then it went from there you know obviously they made a great choice aws uh being nascar's uh cloud so. computing provider and we embody the nascar spirit of if you ain't first you're last so you know clearly that was a match uh, that we need had to have happen so but let's start with that first partnership right that video sure. archive what exactly was the problem there and then how did we solve it? To circle back, like uh, Chris mentioned, at the time they had over, from my understanding, it was just over 6,800 LTO tapes, like you mentioned, in, an, in, a, in a vault, which had over 70 years at the time of, of all their historical races. And the, the, the problem there, the, the challenge was to migrate that on to S3. Yeah. So, so what, what is, first off, you know, for the younger viewers, tapes are what we used to watch stuff on uh, when we walked amongst the dinosaurs and didn't have correct. DVDs or anything else. Uh, and yes. then S3 is uh, Amazon Simple Storage Service. It was the first correct. thing we launched back in 2004, right? Right. And right. It's, I would say it's one of their core services that, that they use across the board for most of their, their solutions. So Amazon S3 came into play because that was, like you mentioned, the 
the, the most secure way and the quickest way to be able to make media available in the, in the AWS cloud. And like you okay. mentioned, being able to leverage S3 opens up a whole another world of, of use cases for them to be able to work with their partners or the broadcast and internally with their um, production facility to be able to, to offload and onload the videos that he mentioned to be able to work with them for production facility. Gotcha. So basically we went from having a bunch of tapes in a vault or in someone's garage. I'm still a little unclear on that. Uh, yes. to having them all at Amazon S3, which uh, for those of you kind of new to the cloud is the best way I can describe it is almost like an online cloud version of like a USB drive. Right. I guess that yeah, that's right. We were talking about this uh, analogy, yeah. right? Nick? <laughs> we were going to use the, li the library, <laughs> the library. Yeah, well, you know, we, 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 before the shows, uh, Carlos and I were talking to everybody about like, how can we explain this? Like, what's a good analogy? And we thought, well, S3 is kind of like a library. Then we realized like, you know, people might not know what the library is or the Dewey decimal system was part of the analogy. And that made us feel super old. So I think we finally settled on S3 almost being like a USB drive or like your iPhone, right? right. Like it's where you store all of this information. So it was a huge project, or I'm sorry, a huge project to take on 70 years of footage. Uh, that's not something that you're just downloading a song from the, you know, from the online Spotify or something. So how did we make that happen? How did we turn these tapes into a digital archive on S3? So the, Building blocks for that were first a direct connect connection from NASCAR facilities. Okay, into so AWS. what does that do? And direct connection, a direct connect connection provides you the most direct path into AWS and a direct path into the AWS backbone. So gotcha. what that does is provides them a direct on ramp into AWS. So in, during that process that they were migrating the uh, tapes into S, uh, S3. The direct connect connection was uh, utilized to be able to create the direct connection into S3, I see. and then uh, they leveraged Lambda to be able to create um, the functions to be to enter the records for these um, media assets that were being uploaded into S3 mm -hmm. into the DynamoDB, which we'll we'll think about like a playlist. Okay. So you have Lambda working as the the per, the the worker. Okay. Uh, keeping track of what's coming in from their tapes archive and keeping track of that and, and updating the, the playlist yeah. of all of the videos in DynamoDB, which is where all the records were kept. So that uh, the ability to leverage Lambda and DynamoDB okay. uh, helped to streamline that process for them. Okay. And then it helped to make it a lot, a lot easier because like you mentioned, it, it, it was a, a large amount of just t raw tapes and this footage itself was a very uh, arduous process, but they were able to, to upload it all into S3 with, I think, gotcha. I believe it's an 18 months. So it, okay. it was those AWS services that helped to facilitate that. And okay. now they're, they, they're up to 75 years now of uh, archives. Wow. So yeah, it's really cool. Hopefully a little it's, bit quicker to upload those last five years in the first 70, right? <laughs> yeah, and I think it's very unique that, you know, they have their complete historical archive in S3 and in AWS. And I think it's a very unique uh, use case that, that only they could have right now. And it gives mm -hmm. them a lot of flexibility as to what they could do with their partners and for their fans and, and customers in general. Gotcha. So let's see if I can summarize that using that analogy sure. we eventually settled on. So basically uh, we had these video archives, uh, you know, the, the tapes of all these videos dating races dating back to the 40s. And we uploaded them to an S3 bucket via AWS Direct Connect. Direct Connect basically just allows a more direct pathway from point A to B. So point A being the video to point B being storage, which was Amazon S3. So right. once we get it into S3, which is kind of, we'll, we'll use the iPhone example, because that seems to be the most up-to-date one we could come up with. <laughs> S3 is like the phone. Uh, DynamoDB is like a playlist you're making on your phone. It's keeping track of everything, what's going in, what's going out, what's playing. And then Lambda would kind of be like me as a user creating those playlists, putting stuff in the playlist, taking stuff out of the playlist. Is that about right? right? Yep. Perfect. That's about so, right. Woo. Okay. I was nervous about that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. We got, we that's, got why, that's why you mentioned it took a while because it's, it, it was a, a big task, but 
as, as we mentioned, they, they, they did it all and it, it's now there. So it, get, it gives them a lot of opportunities to do different things like on their website with the, with the archive. Yeah. Okay. So from there, kind of, we were talking about S3 is kind of a foundational service for them, right? So we've got this historical video archive. We've got it securely stored in Amazon S3. And then the next use case we dove into with NASCAR was these next gen cars right? And getting the stats on race day and getting them to all of the various, I guess, stakeholders that would need them. So we're talking about the teams on the track, the fans at home, broadcast partners. There's like a lot of parties that need access to these stats that we're collecting. Uh, Chris said every 10 milliseconds, right? So I think I read somewhere it was like over 600,000 data points every second because we're in 40 cars (laughs) and we're collecting all this data over and over and over again for three hour periods. So it's Can an insane amount it? of data. Let's <laughs> just yeah. put it that way. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And again, for everybody just joining us now, because I see some, we got some new people in the chat. I'm talking to Carlos Valdez. Uh, we're talking about how NASCAR is using AWS in the cloud to really transform their sport. And right now we're talking about how these next gen cars that NASCAR debuted allows us as fans, uh, the athletes and drivers on the race day, and broadcast everybody to kind of have access to more information than ever and faster than ever. So Carlos, what, how did that happen? Cause that was, that's a long process to be able to get that data from the car to like the app for me as a fan as quickly as possible. Yeah. And Chris did a great job of giving me some insight as to the process on site at the track. Um, it was actually, this actually came about uh, in partnership with AWS professional services, ProServe and it was to, you know, you, you, that use case where they have that now with the next gen car, they have this data, this new set of data points that's coming off the car. And mm-hmm. how do we get it to the teams and the only the manufacturers that he mentioned and the, and the fans too, and the broadcasters to be able to make, make strategy decisions during a race, for instance, like you mentioned, there's war rooms now where teams have, uh, groups of their other teams with engineers off-site trying to uh, devise strategy during a race and what more better way to do that than with using the data that's coming off those cars so the the underlying uh challenge and opportunity with this use case was speed and yeah. and the amount of data so those were both um addressed at, at track like you mentioned with the um with the mobile data center okay. and and the kubernetes cluster that you mentioned but then the co- the cloud component to that uh was enabled by using a direct connect connection again okay, okay. and because that provides the quickest path to aws which is critical specifically in this use case and they've also um, set it up so that each of their tracks has a a, a direct network connection to their direct connect connection, and then pretty much providing an on ramp, another on ramp, as we talked about earlier, okay. into AWS. Okay. So the first use case, um, there's about three pe- there's about three what they call subscribers okay. to this data that's coming uh, into the cloud at this point. There's the first group of subscribers, which is getting that raw data as they would be getting it on the track in, in, the, in those 40 milliseconds that he mentioned in the cloud. You're talking about latency, which is the time from which the the data is uh, gathered to the time you make it available. It was about 200 milliseconds in the cloud. And this is actually leveraging uh, a network load balancer, which kind of acts like the uh, directing traffic from the incoming data streams that's coming in from the track Mm -hmm. to be able to then spread it around the, the EKS, Elastic Kubernetes Service Cluster. Okay. which is the managed version of AWS uh, Kubernetes. Mm-hmm. And then in front of that is another network load balancer, which helps to accelerate connection to this, to these data streams for those subscribers. Yeah. So those subscribers are more than likely the teams and the broadcasters that he mentioned that are providing the stats or the, um, for instance, the car data, mm-hmm. like the acceleration and, and the, um, the mm-hmm. position yeah. in, in their broadcast. So that feed is the quickest and the most raw of those feeds. Okay. And there was there's another feed that comes Here. off of, of okay. there. Let's summarize that. Sure. One. We're getting we're getting some questions. So okay. 
Uh, first and foremost, people asked right as you were getting into it, and I think it's a good question. Uh, why S3 and not another storage system that Amazon offers like uh, EFS, I think was the one uh, this particular viewer was asking. So why, why was S3 chosen to house all this data? My understanding is that S3 provided a, a, a sufficient amount of performance and cost optimization in terms of the storage cost versus EFS or, or any other AWS storage. Okay. And it, it met the, the requirements. And the actual S3 is actually in the other use case that we're going to mention now where yeah. it's actually the data is coming in through the same pipeline through the same direct connection and being branched off by uh, Kinesis Data Firehose service. Yeah. And I think, yeah. a, hmm? I was going to say, I think a life cycle policy played into choosing S3 as well, right? Correct. Yeah, that's that's for the uh, the video archive use case where yeah. they're actually leveraging the, uh, the, life, the storage classes available with S3. to, for instance, the archives that are, that are in permanent storage and are not going to be accessed mm -hmm. in, a, in a very timely fashion. So yeah. For instance, into Glacier, which is a, a storage class so you, uh, you could provide information about. Gotcha. But yeah, it's, yeah. It, it's one of the other the, um, features that's reasons. available with S3. Okay, so let's summarize where we're at so far and make sure, sure everybody's still on the same page. So basically, we've got the cars at the track, these next-gen cars collecting data every 10 milliseconds. I think it's 612,000 data points like every second, right? Correct. Crazy amounts. All 40 cars are collecting this data. And we've got a couple of subscribers that we need to get this data to as much as possible. And the first one that we're focusing on here is the teams at the track, like the guys actually driving and their teams directly on-prem or on-premises, uh, right? So to get to those guys, uh, basically we send the data through, I think, a network load balancer to make sure it's just kind of the gateway, like a rail system, making sure everything goes to the right place. Uh, so data is collected, goes to the trucks that Chris mentioned, all those semis that process the information at the race. And then directly those raw data files go to the teams at the track right away. And that's within 40 milliseconds. They get those raw data files because so they need them faster than anybody else, right? So right, that's, that's the ad that's that's the track. And that the the one you're talking about is, is what we talked about in the cloud subscribers, where yeah. those are usually either team members that are off-site or broadcasters as well. And um, Perfect. the... the the use case for the odd track is, is mainly from the data center, like the mobile okay. data center for NASCAR. Perfect. So the mobile data center sends it directly to the, the teams at the track. I think that's 40 milliseconds, right? It Correct. Takes getting that data to getting it to the teams, which is like mm -hmm. one tenth of a blank or something crazy. So then the other use cases we have are fans and maybe people that aren't on site, but are still related to the team, like engineers or other offsite people that are analyzing the data for their teams and then the broadcasters. So basically the two paths that the data can go to from the trucks is either from those on-premises trucks is either directly to the teams or through this other pathway that gets the data to everybody else, right? Correct. Is that where we're at? Yeah, so that, that's the second use case of the data coming into the cloud from, uh, from that track. And right. so what happens that's... for that? So we, we get the trucks and then after the trucks, what happens to get the data to everybody else that's not a team at the track? That's that's the the first one that I talked about, where it's coming in from the, the mobile data center, the truck, yeah, through a direct connect connection into um, the network load balancer, okay, into the EKS cluster that is pretty much the same uh, a mirror sort of of the uh, Kubernetes cluster at the at the track at the okay. mobile data center. It's in a, in AWS under e, the EKS service, and then in front of that is the network load balancer that helps to accelerate the connection and provide that 200 millisecond response to the subscribers of that specific data feed, which is the raw data feed similar to the ones that the teams are getting at the track. Gotcha. So, so it's just got the 40 second data feed that's directly basically from the trucks to the on-prem on-site teams. We've got this 200 uh, millisecond data stream that goes to subscribers that maybe team members not at track, right? But that Correct. takes a couple extra steps to get out of there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, we got a question. Somebody likes this uh, likes this one. Yes, uh, if you are wondering if this is available later, you can absolutely watch it back here on LinkedIn or Twitch. 
or uh, Debbie in the comments can drop a link to our YouTube page where we upload all of these, usually about a week after the original airing uh, that you can watch back anytime. So uh, we've got two, we've got the team settled then. So we've got right. two remaining stakeholders. We've got the fans and maybe the broadcasters. So what happens to that data? You know, we've got it going to the teams via the trucks, 200 milliseconds or 40 milliseconds, depending on where you're at, right? What about the fans and the broadcast? What are those? What's the path to get to those people? That path is is a, a little different, but it's it's the same path into AWS. The same direct connect connection is uh, the pipeline is coming in via Kinesis Data Firehose. Okay, and that's basically a, a streaming, uh, what they call an ETL ingestion service. It's just a, a, a the way the best. Uh, most efficient way of getting streaming, real-time streaming data into AWS. And it's a managed service as well. And that is being directly ingested or it, it put it into an S3 bucket, which is uh, the main race data center bucket in S3 mm -hmm. for NASCAR. And then from there, they leverage Lambda to then create specific uh, targeted buckets for their individual subscribers and that enhances the security of the um, of the setup so that way the fan data is unique and isolated to the, the data that's going to the broadcasters and to the teams as well so that's a that's the way that they they're able to segment and make sure that okay this information is going for our fans here's this, the s3 bucket and the way they do that is using lambda okay. to uh, a lambda function to uh, appropriately move those uh, move those data files into the appropriate uh, S3 buckets. Okay, so to quickly summarize, and correct me if I'm wrong here, because this is something you and I were practicing before yeah. we were on the same page. Yeah. So, <laughs> basically four different destinations. We've got the cars gathering the data. The data goes to uh, on-site semis uh, that basically collect all that data at the track the day of. From correct. those trucks, the mobile data print yeah, from, from those trucks, there's a couple different paths that it takes. You can either go the raw data directly to the teams on site within about 40 milliseconds. Correct. Or it can go to off-site subscribers for that team to the same data, usually about 200 milliseconds, depending on their internet connection. Uh, and then for fans and broadcasters, there's a different path. All of these kind of managed by EKS clusters and network load balancers to make sure they go to the right place. But if you aren't related to the team, it basically goes to a central s3 bucket just a storage device uh for nascar that all of this data goes to and then we don't give you know fans or everything direct access to that because one uh if there's something wrong with the data we don't want to give fans faulty data and also we don't want somebody trying to hack a car on the track <laughs> so we yeah, created, that would not be good yeah not be good so then we created separate buckets so from that main nascar storage area s3 area it goes to either another S3 area devoted to fans, which is stuff that like powers the app, powers fan experiences, and one to broadcasters, so broadcasters are able to see that. And I think all of that still only takes 200 milliseconds, right? Like that's the longest time it takes for all of this to happen. Uh, to some degree, the the actual 200 millisecond use case is the first one we talked about, the raw feed. Okay. Uh, the, the S3 bucket one uh, is not uh, intended to be, from my understanding, the real-time feed. Okay. The real-time feed for in the cloud is the one that we talked about first. That is the okay. the basically the mirror of the the Kubernetes cluster in the AWS cloud, gotcha. and providing the same raw feed of data, which then the teams take in and they process and they analyze in the in in whatever way they see fit. And that's how those raw feeds is what they use to develop their strategy and to be able to work with their engineers mm -hmm. during a race. Yeah, to be able to update their their strategy, or you know, if they want to pit, or just if they gotcha. want to take tires, that that type of information. Gotcha. The S three bucket destination is more like we talked about for the other use cases that are mm -hmm. not necessarily as uh, near to real time as as needed, but still uh, close as close as possible because. I know that the app for the for the feet, for the consumers or the the fans is fed off of that, so it helps to have that as close to that as possible. So that's that's available through there. Gotcha. Okay. So lots of different use cases there. I know we just mentioned yeah. a lot of services for people. Just to kind of summarize, we've got S3, which is like a storage service, basically in the cloud. Think of it like an online USB drive or 
uh, floppy disk for my fellow generation floppy disk people. Uh, we've got Lambda, which is like the worker that helps all this stuff happen. We've got network load balancer, which is kind of just making sure everything goes where it needs to go as we're ingesting all this data and sending it out to so many different places. We've got Direct Connect that helps NASCAR directly feed data from the cars into all of these things. Uh, my forget we got Firehose uh, that kind of manages. Yeah, Kinesis Data Firehose that kind of manages the overall volume. I think that's a very aptly named service. And then uh, we had one more question here uh, that I think we can quickly touch on. Sure. So, have we developed some specific tools for actually analyzing this data? Or do the teams for NASCAR or for the fans or whatever just have to analyze it themselves? I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this one. I'm going to let you let you take the lead there. Yeah, as Chris mentioned, uh, I think that their intent is to be with the data provider to the okay. teams, and then the teams then go in and, and do their own analysis based upon the strategy that they ter- they determine. Or just it, it's become very unique in terms of just like in any in any form of competition, you have teams in competition. They're gonna have. They're gonna look at the data in their own specific ways, or the way that they think is best for the, their team. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think that the analysis aspect for now, uh, to my understanding, is that it's uh, left up to the teams and the and the subscribers of that data. Okay. But I think, as he mentioned, um, in in the future use cases, there, there's likely going to be uh, work by NASCAR to do their own analysis of, gotcha. of that data. Perfect. So I know we're wrapping up here, Carlos. I want to make sure we've got time for one more question or two. And I also want to make sure that our viewers have the chance. If you want to ask Carlos questions about all of those services, we just kind of name dropped. There's a lot that goes into the NASCAR use case. It's a little bit of a complicated one, but it's crazy to me that we're able to do it all within 200 milliseconds still. Uh, Do you have any questions? Yep. I just wanted to add to, in terms of the uh, previous question about the life cycle policies, I think in, in retrospect, I, I realized that for the video archive use case, the life cycle policies that the S3 offers were key and critical. And it's explained in, in the use case that uh, they have in the public blog post. And that provided them the ability to, like we mentioned, be able to leverage the storage classes within S3 to appropriately put the media assets in those storage classes and take advantage of, you know, for instance, like Glacier that you put uh, data that is not necessarily uh, very active mm-hmm. to in, in that type of storage class. So the life cycle yeah. policy was a, an, an integral part. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying that. I think we did have some questions on that. And again, if you guys have any more questions for Carlos in the last few minutes here as we're wrapping up, please, I encourage you to drop them in the comment section. We'll try to answer as many of them as we can. So Carlos, one more thing I wanted to bring up uh, before you leave here is this app, because I know we're proud of this app. NASCAR is proud of this app. It's a really cool app, (laughs) this NASCAR uh, experience, be able to see what's going on at the track real time. Chris talked about it a lot with uh, what was going on in Chicago with that race this year. How is that app powered? Because that's a completely different service than the ones we've talked about so far. Yes, uh, actually the app, and, and the, the functionality that, that he mentioned, being able to create the, the feeds from the in-car cameras and at, at the track as well to the tra- through the track app was a very unique use case that he, like he mentioned, was uh, rolled out in Chicago. And uh, the services that, le- that were leveraged to be able to do so were a- uh, some of the AWS media services, like for instance, Elemental Media Connect. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, the Elemental Live encoders were also a part of that and then finally there was also a component for uh amazon interactive video service okay provided the the foundation for the feeds and then the front end was uh, leveraging cloud front as well so yeah it's it's like we've talked about they're they're very unique use cases and and i think i mentioned this already as a customer they push us at aws to be able to, to you know produce these these solutions that are just uh they push the envelope basically so yeah, yeah this is this is definitely one because it was it, you're, we were able to provide the fan at the track the, the in-car feeds yeah so that way could, like you mentioned they could see the car the car their favorite driver as it was in another part of the track gotcha all right well uh real quick uh you know as we're wrapping up again i want to make sure uh, we leave time for our customers. And real quick, too, guys, I know we've got a link to a blog 
uh, that talks about this stuff if you want to dive deeply or dive deep in more into how this elemental use case works. Uh, let's make sure that that gets dropped in here. I also see there seems to be a problem with the survey. So let me see if I can fix that real quick for you guys. I think that that was a mistake on my part. <laughs> so survey should be back up and active if people want to look at that. I think I accidentally closed it by mistake. Uh, so please take that survey. Let us know what you think about the show. Let us know other use cases you want to see. Uh, you're getting a lot of shout outs on Twitch and LinkedIn, uh, Carlos, for giving us this detailed look. And again, we'll try to find that link here for the blog that dives deeper into the app use case and what the media services uh, stuff that Carlos mentioned is. So, Carlos, yeah. before you leave today, do you have any... Oh, we just had, we just had one other interesting question. What is the most critical data that the team uh, for the what the cars need? Is it just the video stuff or the real-time data? So like what what's one of the tougher use cases? What's one of the more critical use cases that you've worked on for NASCAR so far? I think in, in relation to the teams, the, the real-time data feeds is the most critical. Um, okay. The video feeds, they help. Uh, I think after the fact, but during a race, the data feeds are the most important. And you could hear, and you watch a race now, and it's like everything's data driven, as Chris mentioned. So I think the data feeds themselves are more critical over the video feeds. Gotcha. All right. Well, thanks again for joining us, Carlos. As you sign off here, what is something that you want customers to walk away from uh, from this episode here with NASCAR today, and from what you've been explaining with the tech? I think um, the key thing here is just to to realize that, I, in my opinion. NASCAR is one of the leaders in motorsports and, and AWS. It's, it's been a very exciting time to be able to help them and, you know, push the envelope of technology and be able to, to address the use cases that they have and just be able to push the technology forward to some. Yeah. The other really thing too, if I may real quick, all yeah. this information that we talked about and is available through our blog post. So I, I recommend that anyone that is interested just, not only in NASCAR's use cases, but in AWS use cases in general. That's one of the great things I find personally is that our blog posts are so informative and they give you like behind the curtains of what's going on with, with the, their use, a customer's use case. And I, I know the NASCAR's use case, uh, the blog posts are very informative. So um, I think All right. posting that there. So yeah. Thanks. Yeah, they've been they've been Sorry. really they're really good reads. I, I back that up with Carlos. They helped me prep for this show a ton. Uh, that I could have gotten through without them, and they are very cool use cases. NASCAR, I know, is one of our premier partners in that it's a very collaborative working with them on updating all this stuff, right, and coming up with these innovations. So yes, thanks. Fan of cloud computing, definitely dive into NASCAR's use cases via those blogs Carlos mentioned. And also, if you're just a fan of NASCAR, it's going to give you some insight into how the heck they're able to do all of this stuff that you see pop up on your broadcast and on the app. So, Carlos, right. thank you so much for joining us today. I'll go ahead and let you go and wrap up the show. Thanks. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Carlos. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. It was uh, Again, I'm Nick from the AWS On Air Sports team. I'm glad that everybody was able to get some questions answered, and it's been really fun talking to Chris from NASCAR and Carlos from AWS about how all these innovations at NASCAR are happening, what it means for their sport, and kind of what we do to make that happen. I really encourage everybody, like we keep saying in the last few minutes here, read those blogs, read those uh, web pages. It has a lot of interesting information that I know if I knew 10 years ago, I probably would have studied a little bit harder in my comp sci classes. There's a lot of really cool use cases out there that I, as a sports fan, had no idea that the cloud was powering. Uh, so I encourage you as a fan as a, of the sport or a fan of cloud computing in general, go ahead and take a look at this stuff. There's a lot of really cool stuff the on-air sport or the AWS sports team is doing. So uh, take a look at that. Uh, next up, coming up October 4th, we're going to be talking with the NHL. Uh, it's one I'm super excited about. Growing up in Colorado, hockey is definitely part of my life. So uh, tune in for that one. We'll post some announcements on our social media in the coming weeks here. If you want to rewatch this episode, you can watch it again, play back on Twitch or LinkedIn, or we will upload it to our YouTube channel in the coming week here. I also want to give a shout out, AWS On Air overall. The sports show is just 
one show on an overarching channel. Uh, we've got a weekly Friday show that goes over all of our recent product launches and gives you real-time demos as to how to use these cloud computing projects. Check that out. It's at noon Pacific time every Friday. And if you go to our webpage uh, on the AWS website, just look up AWS on air, you'll see a schedule for all the other shows that we have, uh, some dealing with startups. If you're a small business or a startup business trying to get you, uh, trying to start using the cloud for the first time, we have one that looks at compute use cases, one that deals with cloud security. They're all really cool. I suggest you, I encourage you all to take a look at those ones as well. So I'm, AW, I'm Nick from AWS On Air Sports. I'll go ahead and sign off and I look forward to seeing you guys back here uh, in two weeks on October 4th. Thanks everyone.